podcast. I'm so happy to be here. Good evening, everyone. Thanks a lot for coming out tonight on this rainy, windy Wednesday night. Our guest tonight is American songwriter, composer, and singer known worldwide as a master of his trade. His songs have been recorded by artists as diverse as Glenn Campbell, Mark Garfunkel, Linda Ronstadt, James Taylor, Elvis Presley, Frank Sinatra, Waylon Jennings, Cassandra Wilson. Uh, you get the idea. Everybody. He's the only artist ever to have received Grammy Awards for music, lyrics, and orchestration. He was the youngest man ever inducted into the National Songwriters Hall of Fame, an organization he currently acts as Chairman Emeritus. His music has connected with millions of people around the world, and his songs are part of the cultural fabric of America. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jenny Webb.
by Waylon Jennings, Chris Christopherson, Johnny Cash, and Willie Nelson. And um, believe you me, I was surprised when I got that phone call. <laughs> Excuse me, uh, are you sure you got the right person? Uh, all four of them? Uh, four different records? No, on the same record? All on the same record? <laughs> you know, it's a pretty amazing thing to happen gentleman of that stature. Caliber. I remember that I that I had been calling up and whining for years, calling the people at Farm Aid and saying, I want to come to Farm Aid. You know? They said, well you can come but you can't play. <laughs> so all of a sudden now Farm Aid's calling me. Huh. You know? They said, well, we, we want you to come, but you still can't play. <laughs> so I went and I had my backstage pass in Irving Stadium, 65,000 people and these great big television screens on both sides that would, as big as this wall here in this fabulous theater. Uh, and these screens were like focused in on every little error or a lapse of judgment that you had ever made in your entire life. Secrets that you thought were well hidden were suddenly exposed to 60. And so uh, I'm walking around back there and I think I'm taking it all in. I'm saying, big show, big show. I'm looking at Bruce Hornsby playing the piano. And all of a sudden, Willie Nelson materializes in front of me in a cloud of smoke. <laughs> Go figure. He had pigtails, a bandana, and everything just like the figure, just like the action figure. <laughs> and he said, Jimmy, I didn't know you were going to be here. And I said, well, I didn't either, but I'm here. And he said, well, that's good. He says, because we were going to do your song. And I said, well, that's good. And he said, well, it's not so good. And I said, mine. He says, because Johnny Cash is sick. And I said, I said oh, no, I, that's too bad. That's disappointing, but still, you know, I'm, I'm happy to be. He said, but, he says, I'm thinking, he said, I think we could probably do your song. I said, okay. I said, uh, great. He said, but you'd have to sing Johnny Cash's part. I said, oh, that's really bad. That's, that's maybe the worst thing I ever heard in my life. And I said, listen, uh, Willie, I said, you know, I'm, I'm only licensed to play for 300 people. <laughs> I could, I could, get, I could have, get, have my license revoked. I could, you know, be thrown out of show business. You know, I, he said, "Hell, Jimmy." He says, "You're wearing black." He said, "Just go out there, and they'll think you're Johnny Cash." <laughs> oh, jeez. I still keep picturing this couple, you know, Maude and Ralph, from like. Idaho, something like that. And, um, and they're sitting there and they're looking at the stage. And look, they can barely see the people on the stage. And, and then Ralph turns to her and he says, Honey, he said, Did you know Johnny Cash could play the piano? <laughs>
so I have to move on. You know, I uh, I was born on a farm, on a, you know, in a farming community. I won't say I was born exactly on the farm, like up on the combine or something like that. <laughs> but uh, I came from the farm, and uh, my dad was a uh, Southern Baptist minister. He served in the Second World War in the South Pacific as a Marine. He was there for 37 months. And when he came back, he came back with a couple of nervous ticks or two, you know. He was only the only guy that, I'm only pretty sure I ever knew, who had a K-bar taped to the steering column of his 48 Mercury. <laughs> and he wanted to be kind of careful when you approached the reverend's car. Because he was a little jumpy. And, uh, He's a good dad, and he preached a great sermon. And uh, my mother was a driving force in my life. She put me on the piano bench when I was six, and she put one of those little chickens with little egg timers on the piano, and she said, wrung its neck like that. She said it for 45 minutes. And she and I had a deal. It was a business agreement, sort of. It was like, if she heard music for 45 minutes, she wouldn't hit me with a stick. <laughs> That's a good agreement. So, that worked out pretty well. Because, you know, by the time I was 12 o'clock, uh, 12, 12 o'clock, by the time I was 12 o'clock, you know, you're watching a man disintegrate right in front of your eyes. So, by the time I was 12 years old, I was the, the accompanist for the Baptist Church. I used to go, actually go out on the, trying to figure out how to get the, water out of this thing before I starve to death. I can't, I can't do it, guys. I can't open it. Um, my dad used to take me out on evangelical missions. He liked to, well, you know, I was 12, you know, 12 years old, you know, playing in the Baptist in the world, and you, let's say you're playing some, some immortal, immortal piece of work like, uh, Amazing grace, right? Well, if you're reading it out in the Baptist hymnal, it's going to sound like this. See, it's one of those like, things I have, you know, where you can't open it. Oh, that guy can't open it.
you know, it came the whole idea of writing songs. And, uh, oh, thank you very much. Think of it as an IQ test, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Keep coming up with these new fangled things. Well, so I went, as fate would have it, I went west to, to California to seek my fortune and um, lost my mother, lost her when I was 16 years old. But she had given me this priceless gift, you know, this ability to, to play the piano. My very first job right out of high school was with Motown Records. And, um, Believe it or not, I wrote 45 songs for Motown Records, and I was I was the only white kid in the building. Um, and I worked with Billy Eckstein, I worked with Tony Martin, for the, those MGM musical lovers out there, Brenda Holloway, and I, I had my first professional recording released by the Supremes on a Christmas album. It was called uh, Merry Christmas from the Supremes, and I don't remember much about my Christmas tree, which is my song. My Christmas tree was no threat to white Christmas. <laughs> I, 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 can remember, I can remember a little bit of it, sort of like, Oh, my Christmas tree isn't very big. In fact, it's kind of small. And then it kind of went downhill. <laughs> trash out of the building is I'll take that Especially that by the time I get to finish, oh God, what a stinker that is. So they didn't want to get those songs near their other songs because they were afraid it would corrupt them or something. And I went over to Johnny Rivers Music, the first time Johnny Rivers Music heard by the time Johnny, Johnny Rivers. Secret Age of Man. Actually put out an album with uh, by the time I get to Phoenix I mean, Including this one. How can you tell me how much you miss me?
that was really cool because within a week or so after Glenn heard it, I heard it on the radio with Glenn Campbell, you know, singing it, which uh, the first time I heard Glenn Campbell, I was 14 years old, I was out in the middle of a wheat field, turning the wheat over so we could plant another crop. And I heard Glenn on the radio singing this little tune. And went, there is someone watching your footsteps turn around. Look at me. Did you ever hear that? Yes. There is
the song is about drugs. And I said, yeah. And he said, well, we'll see about that. And I the phone like that. Went out, took, got his Bible, and his 45. Got his pickup, and drove down to Oklahoma City. And drove up to KMA, which is just, a, oh. just an old house out in the middle of the field, ladies and gentlemen. There were no metal detectors, there was no Kevlar, there was no Kevlar, you know, there were no SIG, you know, two six twos there, anything like that. You could just, anybody could walk into a video station. Can you imagine doing that today? Just throwing mm -hmm. it there for a minute. Because you'd probably get maybe killed, I don't know. Uh, but uh, he walked in and he said, I want to see the program director. He didn't want to go with uh, him. But they got, I would say, a very serious impression of him. And uh, they brought out the program director and they went to the conference room. And then the people that, who were witnessing the event said later that they thought that some sort of conversion took place. <laughs> because they could hear the program director saying, Oh, sweet Jesus, and, oh, dear Lord, and, and, and crying, and all kinds of stuff, you know, and, uh, and after a while, you know, things got quiet, and, and uh, my dad came walking out of there, and the program director came a little sheepish about five or ten minutes later. <laughs> Pigeon, 
Gene Simmons, Charlton, uh, not Charlton Heston, and he wasn't. <laughs> But a lot of stars were there. It was a star-studded evening, and I just kind of sit in the back like I was at a funeral or a wedding or something, and, and play the piano and for these different poems and things that were read. And the director of the thing was this crazy Irish guy named Richard Harris. He was like, he was like swinging around the stage on ropes, you know, the platform, the platform. He was into some kind of a, I don't know, anti-plot type of thing that was going on. Um, but he and I used to go out after rehearsals because we were rehearsing for a couple of weeks. And uh, he started offering me a drink and I started taking one every once in a while. So, you know, I was, I was a beer drinker. It gets hard, really hard to get through college without drinking a couple of beers. And I'd had a couple of beers. But I'd never met anybody like this before. <laughs> and uh, he would say, oh, I'm Jimmy Rabbit, because he always called me Jimmy, and he always, he always called me, he never, let me put it this way, he never called me Jimmy, and he never called me Webb, but he always called me Jimmy Webb. <laughs> and he said, ah, oh, Jimmy Webb, we'll have to go out tonight after we are something, and we'll have to have some black belts. And um, I had no idea what a freaking black velvet was, but we went out and I found out quickly that a black velvet was half Guinness and half champagne. And I found out that about four of those would put you flat on your back, kind of trying to, not to drown, you know, in the waves that keep knocking you down. And we got to be pretty good buddies and Sometimes we're in these kind of uh, very, very affectionate moods because of the liquor and the camaraderie of doing a show together. It's a big thing, people, you know that? Doing a show together is like, it's a special bond. And um, he, one night I said to him, I put my arm around him and said, hey Richard, you know, we ought to make a record. You know, well I said that to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> One, one night in New York, you know, I was, I was in the back of this cab going uptown, and this guy was playing all this far out Eastern music, you know, like Middle Eastern music. And I thought it was out of record. Um, and he's listening to records in the studio in San Francisco. I went up, and as I walked in, David Crosby and Brad Nash were walking out with their guitar cases. And I said, Hey, hi guys. And they said, Good luck, pal. <laughs> I know, man, how terrible could this guy be? If I had only known. And I went in, and here's this aristocratic, very handsome guy with this pile of curly blonde hair on top of his head. And he has this weird, pretty aesthetic, sort of distant way of almost dealing with the third person saying, I wonder what kind of music Artie's going to like today. He's talking about himself, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and I played uh, song after song after song, and, and uh, nothing's happening much, you know. Uh, the country stuff, he doesn't want to touch with a 10 foot pole. And I had a couple of things that he had showed interest in, but nothing killed him. And I really all of a sudden, I was out of songs. I'd, I'd gone up 20 songs, I didn't have any song, I had nothing to play with. And I was kind of nervously playing with the piano the way I do, you've noticed. And I sort of start playing this old Baptist hymn. Are there any Baptists in here? A couple? There's one Baptist in here? Holy moly! The world is coming to me. And I started playing this song called Come Now Found. And it's just gorgeous, and, and my fingers found it. You know?
stolen one of Jesus's. <laughs> This kind of silly something that I wrote, this beauty queen, which really came from the heart, and it kind of evoked the Baptist hymn. It quoted the Baptist hymn in the nicest possible way. It wasn't a, a copy of anything, but it was a it was reaching deep towards some of the old invitational hymnals, like "Just as I Am," without one plea. Very, very deep things and very, very hard to get away from. Once you're under the spell of that music, it stays with you. I started. And uh, 
the band, Ashley and, and uh, Shannon, uh, uh, the kids, the camp kids are on stage and they're sort of retuning and getting ready for the next song. And Glenn sort of quietly goes back and da -da 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 -da. starts playing the intro to Wichita Farm and the Gator. And it becomes obvious in a hurry that Glenn is going to do that song again. <laughs> so the band falls in behind Dad, you know, and, and backstage, you know, they're, you know, and it's like, oh no, he's, he's going to play it twice. And he did play it twice. And the second time he did it, he did it even better than he did it the first time. It was, I, I mean, it was better. And um, after the song, it was this silence. And for a second, you didn't know because you didn't know whether the audience was like, oh, gee, this is weird, you know. Or, I mean, certainly backstage, they were having heart attacks and, and, and uh, various kind of histrion histrionics were going on. About, oh, everybody will know it will be in the newspaper. Uh, everybody sort of knew anyway, didn't they, by then? Uh, and so the Aussies sit there for a second and then way in the back, one guy says, do it again. <laughs> and the next guy says, do it again. And then finally there's a bunch of them, you know how they are. Do it again. Do it again. Do it again. And then it's the whole audience. And they stand up and they shout, do it again. That's why I love them so much, so much. You didn't see that, did you? And then he squirted himself with a... You know, um, I wrote a song back when I was working for Johnny Rivers called Do What You Gotta Do. He cut it right away. Uh, it was almost immediately recorded by Nina Simone. She had like a love affair with this song, which you should check out on record sometime because it's just phenomenal to hear Simone, who was an artist and, and a sort of profoundly uh, troubled person. And, and it seems that she found in that song something that she could relate to. And, after she recorded the song, there were many others. Uh, uh, it became the kind of thing to do, the four tops cutting. Uh, Sweet Revenge on Motown, right? The four tops cut it, Leonard Ronstadt cut it. Um, of course, Glenn cut it. He cut, he cut everything. <laughs> not know it just to look at me, but I have a hit on the charts right now. Uh, and it's actually, uh, I share, I share, I, I really don't know anything about hip, hip hop at all, but I know that there's this record out called Famous that's Kanye West and Rihanna. And Rihanna sings my song, Do What You Gotta Do, while Kanye West, like, trashes Taylor Swift. <laughs> if that makes any sense to you. Okay? Oh, so, um, I actually love to do this song, and I'm gonna do it, because it's a singer's song, and I, I, I'm gonna do it tonight just to let you know that I'm still current. <laughs> I'm not going to do any rapping. I don't. I don't. I don't do rapping. I don't, I'm not against it. I'm not against it. I, I, yeah, I'm not. It's a mode of expression. It's very
No, 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 no. no. And I, I'm almost, I'm almost gone because I, I can hear them getting the hook ready backstage. It's a long telescoping thing. Uh, uh, I want to say uh, that I, I have a couple of things for you. I'm going to come out and see you and uh, sign any kind of memorabilia that you have. And I'd just like, frankly, enjoy having an opportunity to say hello. Um, it's one of my favorite things. And I've got a couple of records with me, you know, like years and years ago when I was in high school, we used to sell records out of the trunks of our cars. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, after 60 years of blinding technological progress, we are back to selling records out of the trunks of our cars. <laughs> Thank you, Steve Jobs. I appreciate you making a place for us in your universe. Uh, now, uh, what I have here is a couple of albums that were uh, extremely well thought of and placed on the charts. Albeit, it was the geezer chart. I will not lie, it was the geezer chart. But uh, their brother and sister albums that were done with uh, musicians like Jerry Douglas and and, uh, and Ben Skill, people like that. And uh, the first one was called Just Across the River. And uh, I'll thank you, those of you who've heard it. And that's that's the name of the new song that I go for. Billy Joel sang by the, uh, Wichita Line and on. Vince Gill and I did a song together. Lucinda Wilson and I did, did uh, Galveston. Willie Nelson was on the record. Jackson Brown, St. Peter Sloan. Mark Knopfler came, Knopfler came in to play guitar. Linda Ronstadt's last performance is on that album. She never sang it. She sang it beautifully, and then she never sang it again. And the only, the only recording ever in the history of Glenn and I singing together. And there may be some very good reasons for that. Uh, but Glenn and I did, uh, by the time we went to Phoenix, I was just across the river. And then, uh, there was uh, some demand to, to do another record, and we did uh, uh, Still Within the Sound of My Voice, which is a top mm, ten beautiful. single for Glenn and I. Um, and my guests on that album were Carly Simon, I Love It, Keith Urban, Joe Cocker, the great Mark Cohen, Walking in Memphis, Silver Thunderbird, Love Mark, uh, David Crosby, David Crosby, Graham Nash, old buddies. And I also got the, the, uh, uh, the uh, oh my God, I have a senior moment here, but uh, uh, who, who used to sing background for Elvis? Uh, Jordanaires. The Jordanaires. Can I get the Jordanaires back together? They were like 80 years old when the was falling out. They came to the studio and they, they sang, they made it. that first chord. It sounded like the damn Jordanaires. You know what I mean? So they're on there on a song called Elvis and Me, which is song. I, I knew Elvis a little bit. So um, those are out there along with uh, some other odds and ends. Uh, Ten Easy Pieces is out there for those of you who have heard of that record. Um, uh, a lady just came up and, and she was uh, very emotional about uh, my friend Harry Nielsen. I rarely could get through a show without doing, doing some sort of a little bit on Harry, but uh, she asked me to do something, so briefly I'm just going to do a little thing. In fact, maybe I'll just do this song. Harry recorded this song. It was about an old Spanish house where I used to live out in the valley. It was built by Alice. It was built by Phil. Phil. Who, who was the guy who played the bear in John Harris? It was built by Phil Harris for Alice Faith. And, uh, and he sold it to me. Thank you. 